Chapter 31 As new men were permitted to do whenever there was no conflict with their duties, Kunta and others of his kafa would sit at the outermost edges of the formal sessions of the Council of Elders, which were held once each moon under Jafur's ancient baobab. Sitting beneath it on cured hides very close together, the six senior elders seemed almost as old as the tree, Kunta thought, and to have been carved from the same wood, except that they were as black as ebony against the white of their long robes and round skullcaps. Seated facing them were those with troubles or disputes to be resolved. Behind the petitioners, in rows, according to their ages, sat junior elders such as Amoro, and behind them sat the new men of Quintas Cafo. And behind them the village women could sit, though they rarely attended except when someone in their immediate family was involved in a matter to be heard. Once in a long while, all the women would be present but only if a case held the promise of some juicy gossip. No women at all attended when the council met to discuss purely administrative affairs, such as Jafur's relationship with other villages. On the day for matters of the people, however, the audience was large and noisy, but all settled quickly into silence when the most senior of the elders raised his stick sewn with bright colored beads to strike out on the talking drum before him the name of the first person to be heard. This was done according to their ages, to serve the needs of the oldest first. Whoever it was would stand, stating his case, the senior elders all staring at the ground, listening until he finished and sat down. At this point, any of the elders might ask him questions. If the matter involved a dispute, the second person now presented his side, followed by more questions, whereupon the elders turned around to present their backs as they huddled to discuss the matter, which could take a long time. One or more might turn with further questions, but all finally turned back around toward the front, one motioning the person or persons being heard to stand again and the senior elder then spoke their decision, after which the next name was drum-talked. Even for new men like Kunta, most of these hearings were routine matters. People with babies recently born asked for a bigger farm plot for the husband and an additional rice plot for the wife, requests that were almost always quickly granted, as were the first farming land requests of unmarried men like Kunta and his mates. During man-training, the Kintango had directed them never to miss any Council of Elders sessions unless they had to, as the witnessing of its decisions would broaden a man's knowledge as his own reigns increased until he too would be a senior elder. Attending his first session, Quinta had looked at Amoro seated ahead of him, wondering how many hundreds of decisions his father must have in his head, though he wasn't even a senior elder yet. At his first session, Quinta witnessed a land matter involving a dispute. Two men both claimed the fruit of some trees originally planted by the first man on land to which the second man now had the farming rights, since the first man's family had decreased. The Council of Elders awarded the fruit to the first man, saying, if he hadn't planted the trees, that fruit wouldn't be there. At later sessions, Quinta saw people frequently charged with breaking or losing something borrowed from an irate lender who claimed that the articles had been both valuable and brand new. Unless the borrower had witnesses to disprove that, he was usually ordered to pay for or replace the article at the value of a new one. Quinta also saw furious people accusing others of inflicting bad fortune on them through evil magic. One man testified that another had touched him with a cock's spur, making him violently ill. A second wife declared that her new mother-in-law had hidden some boring shrub in the wife's kitchen, causing whatever was cooked there to turn out badly. 
and a widow claimed that an old man whose advances she had spurned had sprinkled powdered eggshells in her path, making her walk into a long succession of troubles, which she proceeded to describe. If presented with enough impressive evidence of evil magic's motives and results, the council would command immediate corrective magic to be done by the nearest traveling magic man, whom a drum talk message would summon to Jafur at the expense of the evil doer. Quinta saw debtors ordered to pay up, even if they had to sell their possessions, or with nothing to sell, to work off the amount as the lender's slave. He saw slaves charging their masters with cruelty, or with providing unsuitable food or lodgings, or with taking more than their half share of what the slaves' work had produced. Masters, in turn, accused slaves of cheating by hiding some of their produce, or of insufficient work, or of deliberately breaking farm tools. Quinta saw the council weigh carefully the evidence in these cases, along with each person's past record in the village, and it was not uncommon for some slaves' reputations to be better than their masters. But sometimes there was no dispute between a master and his slave. Indeed, Kunta saw them coming together asking permission for the slave to marry into the master's family, but any couple intending to marry first had to obtain the council's permission. Couples judged by the council to be too close of kinship were refused out of hand, but for those not thus disqualified, there was a waiting period of one moon between the request and the reply, during which the villagers were expected to pay quiet visits to any senior elder and reveal any private information, either good or bad, about the couple in question. Since childhood, had each of them always demonstrated a good home training? Had either of them ever caused undue trouble to anyone, including their own families? Had either of them ever displayed any undesirable tendencies of any kind, such as cheating or telling less than the full truth? Was the girl known for being irritable and argumentative? Was the man known for beating goats unmercifully? If so, the marriage was refused, for it was believed that such a person might pass these traits along to his or her children. But as Kunta knew even before he began attending the council sessions, most couples won approval for marriage, because both sets of parents involved had already learned the answers to these questions, and found them satisfactory, before granting their own permission. At the council sessions, however, Kunta learned that sometimes parents hadn't been told things that people did tell the senior elders. Kunta saw one marriage permission flatly refused when a witness came forth to testify that the young man of the planned marriage, as a young goat herd, had once stolen a basket from him, thinking he hadn't been seen. The crime hadn't been reported then, out of compassion for the fact that he was still a boy. If it had been reported, the law would have dictated that his right hand be cut off. Quinta sat riveted as the young thief, exposed at last, burst into tears, blurting out his guilt before his horrified parents and the girl he was asking to marry, who began screaming. Soon afterward, he disappeared from Jafur and was never seen or heard of again. After attending council sessions for a number of moons, Kunta guessed that most problems for the senior elders came from married people, especially from men with two, three, or four wives. Adultery was the most frequent charge by such men, and unpleasant things happened to an offending man if a husband's accusation was backed up with convincing outside testimony or other strong evidence. If a wronged husband was poor and the offending man well off, the council might order the offender to deliver his possessions to the husband, one at a time, until the husband said, I have enough, which might not be until the adulterer had only his bare hut left. But with both men poor, which was usually the case, the council might order the offender to work as the husband's slave for a period of time considered worth the wrongful use of his wife. 
and Kunta flinched for one repeated offender when the elder set a date and time for him to receive a public flogging of 39 lashes across his bare back by his most recently wronged husband, according to the ancient Muslim rule of 40 save one. Quinta's own thoughts about getting married cooled somewhat as he watched and listened to the angry testimony of injured wives and husbands before the council. Men charged that their wives failed to respect them, were unduly lazy, were unwilling to make love when their turn came, or were just generally impossible to live with. Unless an accused wife presented a strong counter-argument with some witnesses to hear her out, the senior elders usually told the husband to go that day and set any three possessions of his wife's outside her hut and then utter toward those possessions three times with witnesses present the words, I divorce you. A wife's most serious charge, certain to bring out every woman in the village if it was suspected in advance, was to claim that her husband was not a man, meaning that he was inadequate with her in bed. The elders would appoint three old persons, one from the family of the defiant wife, another from the family of the husband, and the third from among the elders themselves. A date and time would be set for them to observe the wife and the husband together in his bed. If two of the three voted that the wife was right, she won her divorce, and her family kept the dowry goats. But if two observers voted that the husband performed well, he not only got the goats back, but also could beat the wife and divorce her if he wished to. In the reigns since Kunta had returned from manhood training, no case that had been considered by the council filled him and his mates with as much anticipation as the one that began with gossip and whispering about two older members of their own kafo and a pair of Jafur's most eligible widows. On the day the matter finally came before the council, nearly everyone in the village gathered early to assure themselves of the best possible seats. A number of routine old people's problems were settled first, and then came the case of Dembo Dabo and Kadi Tamba, who had been granted a divorce more than a reign before but now were back before the council grinning widely and holding hands and asking permission to remarry. They stopped grinning when the senior elder told them sternly, You insisted on divorce, therefore you may not remarry, until each of you has had another wife and husband in between. The gasps from those in the rear were hushed by the drum talk announcement of the next names to be called. Tuda Tamba and Kalilu Kante, Fanta Bedeng and Sefokila. The two members of Kunta's Kafo and the two widows stood up. The taller widow, Fanta Bedeng, spoke for all of them, sounding as if she had carefully practiced what to say, but nervousness still gripped her. Tuda Tamba with her 32 reigns and I with my 33 have small chance of catching more husbands, she said, and proceeded to ask the council to approve of Tiria friendships for her and Tuda Tamba, to cook for and sleep with Sifokila and Kalilu Kante, respectively. Different elders asked a few questions of all four, the widows responding confidently, Kunta's friends uncertainly, in sharp contrast to their usual boldness of manner, and then the elders turned around, murmuring among themselves. The audience was so tense and quiet that a dropped ground nut could have been heard as the elders finally turned back around. The senior elder spoke, Allah would approve. You widows will have a man to use, and you new men will get valuable experience for when you marry later. The senior elder wrapped his stick twice hard against the edge of the talking drum and glared at the buzzing women in the rear. Only when they fell silent was the next name called, Jenka Jalan. Having but 15 reigns, she was thus the last to be heard. All of Jafur had danced and feasted when she found her way home after escaping from some tubob who had kidnapped her. Then, a few moons later, she became big with child, although unmarried, which caused much gossip. 
young and strong, she might still have found some old man's acceptance as a third or fourth junior wife. But then the child was born. He was a strange pale tan color, like a cured hide, and had very odd hair. And wherever Jenka Jalan would appear thereafter, people would look at the ground and hurry elsewhere, her eyes glistening with tears. She stood up now and asked the council, what was she to do? The elders didn't turn around to confer. The senior elder said they would have to weigh the matter, which was a most serious and difficult one, until the next moon's council meeting. And with that, he and the five other elders rose and left. Troubled and somehow unsatisfied by the way the session had ended, Kunta remained seated for a few moments after most of his mates and the rest of the audience had gotten up, chattering among themselves and headed back toward their huts. His head was still full of thoughts when Binta brought his evening meal, and he said not a word to her as he ate nor she to him. Later, as he picked up his spear and his bow and arrow and ran with his wolo dog to his sentry post, for this was his night to stand guard outside the village, Quinta was still thinking about the tan baby with the strange hair, about his no doubt even stranger father, and about whether this two bob would have eaten Jenka Jalan if she had not escaped from him. Chapter 32 In the moonlit expanse of ripening fields of ground nuts, Kunta climbed the notched pole and sat down cross-legged on the lookout platform that was built into its sturdy fork, high above the ground. Placing his weapons beside him, along with the axe with which he planned the next morning, at last, to chop the wood for his drum frame, he watched as his wolo dog went trotting and sniffing this way and that in the fields below. During Kunta's first few moons on sentry duty, rains ago, he remembered snatching at his spear if so much as a rat went rustling through the grass. Every shadow seemed a monkey, every monkey a panther, and every panther a tubob, until his eyes and ears became seasoned to his task. In time, he found he could tell the difference between the snarl of a lion and that of a leopard. It took longer, however, for him to learn how to remain vigilant through these long nights. When his thoughts began to turn inward, as they always did, he often forgot where he was and what he was supposed to be doing. But finally, he learned to keep alert with half of his mind and yet still explore his private thoughts with the other. Tonight he was thinking about the Taria friendships that had been approved for his two friends by the Council of Elders. For several moons they had been telling Kunta and his mates that they were going to take their case before the Council, but no one had really believed them. And now it was done. Perhaps at this very moment, he thought, they might be performing the Taria act in bed with their two widows. Kunta suddenly sat upright trying to picture what it must be like. It was chiefly from his Kafo's gossip that Kunta knew what little he did about under women's clothes. In marriage negotiations, he knew, girls' fathers had to guarantee them as virgins to get the best bride price, and a lot of bloodiness was connected with women. He knew that. Every moon they had blood, and whenever they had babies, and the night when they got married. Everyone knew how the next morning, the newlyweds' two mothers went to the hut to put into a woven basket the white pagni cloth the couple had slept on, taking its bloodiness as proof of the girl's virginity to the Alimamo, who only then walked around the village drum-talking Allah's blessings on that marriage. If that white cloth wasn't bloodied, Kunta knew the new husband would angrily leave the hut with the two mothers as his witnesses and shout loudly, I divorce you, three times for all to hear. But Taria involved none of that, only new men sleeping with a willing widow and eating her cooking. Quinta thought for a little while about how Jinnam Baki had looked at him, making no secret of her designs, 
amid the previous day's jostling crowd as the council session ended. Almost without realizing, he squeezed his hard photo, but he forced back the strong urge to stroke it because that would seem as if he was giving in to what that widow wanted, which was embarrassing even to think about. He didn't really want the stickiness with her, he told himself. But now that he was a man, he had every right, if he pleased, to think about Taria. Which the senior elders themselves had shown was nothing for a man to be ashamed of. Kunta's mind returned to the memory of some girls he and Lamed had passed in one village when returning from their gold hunting trip. There had been about ten of them, he guessed, all beautifully black, in tight dresses, colorful beads and bracelets, with high breasts and little hair plates sticking up. They had acted so strangely as he went by that it had taken Kunta a moment to realize that the show they made of looking away whenever he looked at them meant not that they weren't interested in him, but that they wanted him to be interested in them. Females were so confusing, he thought. Girls of their age in Jafur never paid enough attention to him even to look away. Was it because they knew what he was really like? Or was it because they knew he was far younger than he looked, too young to be worthy of their interest? Probably the girls in that village believed no traveling man leading a boy could have less than 20 or 25 reigns, let alone his 17. They would have scoffed if they had known. Yet he was being sought after by a widow who knew very well how young he was. Perhaps he was lucky not to be older, Kunta thought. If he was, the girls of Jafur would be carrying on over him the way the girls of that village had, and he knew they all had just one thing on their minds, marriage. At least Jinnah and Baki was too old to be looking for anything more than a Taria friendship. Why would a man want to marry when he could get a woman to cook for him and sleep with him without getting married? There must be some reason. Perhaps it was because it was only through marrying that a man could have sons. That was a good thing. But what would he have to teach those sons until he had lived long enough to learn something about the world? Not just from his father, and from the Arafang, and from the Kintango, but also by exploring it for himself, as his uncles had done. His uncles weren't married even yet, though they were older than his father, and most men of their reigns had already taken second wives by now. Was Amaro considering taking a second wife? Quinta was so startled at the thought that he sat up straight. And how would his mother feel about it? Well, at least Binta, as the senior wife, would be able to tell the second wife her duties, and make certain she worked hard and set her sleeping turns with Amaro. Would there be trouble between the two women? No, he was sure Binta wouldn't be like the Kintango's senior wife, whom it was commonly known shouted so much abuse at his junior wives, keeping them in such a turmoil that he rarely got any peace. Quinta shifted the position of his legs to let them hang for a while over the edge of his small perch, to keep the muscles from cramping. His wolo dog was curled on the ground below him, its smooth brown fur shining in the moonlight, but he knew that the dog only seemed to be dozing, and that his nose and ears were alertly twitching for the night air's slightest smell or sound of warning to bound up racing and barking after the baboons that had lately been raiding the ground nut fields almost every night. During each long lookout duty, few things pleased Kunta more than when, maybe a dozen times in the course of a night, he would be jerked from his thoughts by sudden distant snarlings as a baboon was sprung upon in the brush by a big cat. Especially if the baboon's growling turned into a scream quickly hushed, which meant that it had not escaped. But it all was quiet now as Quinta sat on the edge of his platform and looked out across the fields. The only sign of life, in fact, beyond the tall grass was the bobbing yellow light of a Fulani herdsman in the distance as he waved his grass torch to frighten away some animal, 
probably a hyena, that was roaming too close to his cows. So good were the Fulani attending cattle that people claimed they could actually talk with their animals. And Amaro had told Quinta that each day, as part of their pay for herding, the Fulani would siphon a little blood from the cows' necks, which they mixed with milk and drank. What a strange people, thought Quinta. Yet though they were not Mandinka, they were from the Gambia, like him. How much stranger must be the people and the customs one would find beyond the borders of his land. Within a moon after he returned from gold hunting with Lamin, Kunta had been restless to get on the road once again, this time for a real trip. Other young men of his kafo he knew were planning to travel somewhere as soon as the ground nuts and couscous got harvested, but none was going to venture far. Quinta, however, meant to put his eyes and feet upon that distant place called Mali, where, some three or four hundred reigns before, according to Amaro and his uncles, the Kinti clan had begun. These forefather Kintis, he remembered, had won fame as blacksmiths, men who had conquered fire to make iron weapons that won wars and iron tools that made farming less hard. And from this original Kinti family, all of their descendants and all of the people who worked for them had taken the Kinti name. And some of that clan had moved to Mauritania, the birth of Kunta's holy man grandfather, so that no one else, even Omoro, would know about his plan until he wanted it known, Quinta had consulted in the strictest confidence with the Arafang about the best route to Mali. Drawing a rough map in the dust, then tracing his finger along it, he had told Quinta by following the banks of the Kambi Bolongo about six days in the direction of one's prayers to Allah, a traveler would reach Samo Island. Beyond there, the river narrowed and curved sharply to the left and began a serpent's twists and turns, with many confusing bolongs leading off as wide as the river, whose swampy banks couldn't be seen in some areas for the thickness of the mangroves, growing sometimes as high as ten men. Where one could see the river banks, the schoolmaster told him, they abounded with monkeys, hippopotamus, giant crocodiles, and herds of as many as five hundred baboons. But two to three days of that difficult traveling should bring Kunta to a second large island, where the low, muddy banks would rise into small cliffs matted with shrubs and small trees. The trail, which twisted alongside the river, would take him past villages of Bansang, Karantaba, and Diabugu. Soon afterward, he would cross the eastern border of the Gambia and enter the kingdom of Fuladu, and half days walking from there, he would arrive at the village of Fatoto. Out of his bag, Kunta took the scrap of cured hide the Arafang had given him. On it was the name of a colleague in Fatoto who he said would give Kunta directions for the next 12 to 14 days, which would take him across a land called Senegal. Beyond that, said the Arafang, lay Mali and Kunta's destination, Kaba, that land's main place. To go there and return, the Arafang figured would take about a moon, not counting whatever time Quinta chose to spend in Mali. So many times had Quinta drawn and studied the route on his hut's dirt floor, erasing it before Binta brought his meals, that he could almost see it before him as he sat on his perch in the ground nut fields. Thinking about the adventures that awaited him along the trail, and in Mali, he could hardly contain his eagerness to be off. He was almost as eager to tell Lamin of his plans, not only because he wanted to share his secret, but also because he had decided to take his little brother along. He knew how much Lamin had boasted about that earlier trip with his brother. Since then, Lamin had also been through manhood training and would be a more experienced and trustworthy traveling companion. But Quinta's deepest reason for deciding to take him, he had to admit, was simply that he wanted company. 
For a moment, Kunta sat in the dark smiling to himself, thinking of Lamin's face when the time would come for him to know. Kunta planned, of course, to drop the news in a very offhand way, as if he had just happened to think of it. But before then, he must speak about it with Amoro, whom he knew now would feel no undue concern. In fact, he was sure that Amoro would be deeply pleased, and that even Binta, though she would worry, would be less upset than before. Kunta wondered what he might bring to Binta from Mali that she would treasure even more than her quills of gold. Perhaps some fine molded pots, or a bolt of beautiful cloth. Omoro and his uncles had said that the ancient Kinti women in Mali had been famed for the pots they made and for the brilliant patterns of cloth they wove. So maybe the Kinti women there still did those things. When he returned from Mali, it occurred to Kunta, he might still plan another trip for a later rain. He might even journey to that distant place beyond endless sands where his uncles had told of the long caravans of strange animals with water stored in two humps on their backs. Kalilu Konta and Sefokila could have their old ugly Taria widows. He, Kunta Kinti, would make a pilgrimage to Mecca itself. Happening at that moment to be staring in the direction of that holy city, Kunta became aware of a tiny, steady yellow light far across the fields. The Fulani herdsman over there, he realized, was cooking his breakfast. Kunta hadn't even noticed the first faint streaks of dawn in the east. Reaching down to pick up his weapons and head home, he saw his axe and remembered the wood for his drum frame. But he was tired, he thought. Maybe he'd chop the wood tomorrow. No, he was already halfway to the forest, and if he didn't do it now, he knew he would probably let it go until his next sentry duty, which was twelve days later. Besides, it wouldn't be manly to give in to his weariness. Moving his legs to test for any cramps and feeling none, he climbed down the notched pole to the ground, where his wolo dog waited, making happy little barks and wagging his tail. After kneeling for his suba prayer, Kunta got up, stretched, and took a deep breath of the cool morning air, and set off toward the bolong at a lope. Are you enjoying this reading so far? Welcome to Right Here Audio, the group run by students for students who wish they had someone to read academic literature to them. We read content for anyone who has a hard time reading by themselves. This includes persons with blindness, dyslexia, ADHD, and anyone else who could use some support. Do you have anything you would like us to read for you? Comment down below and we'll get started. For those of you who have supported us since day one, we are so grateful for your support. And if you're new or haven't subscribed yet, Join our small community dedicated to increasing accessibility one small step at a time. Now, let's get back to our reading. Chapter 33 The familiar perfumes of wild flowers filled Kunta's nostrils as he ran, wetting his legs through grass glistening with dew in the first rays of sunshine. Hawks circled overhead looking for prey, and the ditches beside the fields were alive with the croaking of frogs. He veered away from a tree to avoid disturbing a flock of blackbirds that filled its branches like shiny black leaves. But he might have saved himself the trouble, for no sooner had he passed by than an angry, raucous cawing made him turn his head in time to see hundreds of crows bullying the blackbirds from their roost. Breathing deeply as he ran, but still not out of breath, he began to smell the musky aroma of the mangroves as he neared the low, thick underbrush that extended far back from the banks of the Bolong. At the first sight of him, a sudden snorting spread among the wild pigs, which in turn set off a barking and snarling among the baboons, whose big males quickly pushed their females and babies behind them. When he was younger, he would have stopped to imitate them, 
grunting and jumping up and down, since this never failed to annoy the baboons, who would always shake their fists and sometimes throw rocks. But he was no longer a boy, and he had learned to treat all of Allah's creatures as he himself wished to be treated, with respect. Fluttering white waves of egrets, cranes, storks, and pelicans rose from their sleeping places as he picked his way through the tangled mangrove down to the bolong. Kunta's wolo dog raced ahead chasing water snakes and big brown turtles down their mudslides into the water, where they left not even a ripple. As he always did whenever he felt some need to come here after a night's lookout duty, Kunta stood a while at the edge of the bolong, today watching a gray heron trailing its long, thin legs as it flew at about a spear's height above the pale green water, rippling the surface with each downbeat of its wings. Though the heron was looking for smaller game, he knew that this was the best spot along the bolong for Kujalo, a big, powerful fish that Kunta loved to catch for Binta, who would stew it for him with onions, rice, and bitter tomatoes. With his stomach already rumbling for breakfast, it made him hungry just to think of it. A little farther downstream, Kunta turned away from the water's edge along the path he himself had made to an ancient mangrove tree that he thought must know him after countless visits, as well as he knew it. Pulling himself up into the lowest branch, he climbed all the way to his favorite perch near the top. From here, in the clear morning, with the sun warm on his back, he could see all the way to the next bend in the bolong, still carpeted with sleeping waterfowl, and beyond them to the women's rice plots, dotted with their bamboo shelters for nursing babies. In which one of them, he wondered, had his mother put him when he was little? This place in the early morning would always fill Kunta with a greater sense of calm and wonder than anywhere else he knew of. Even more than in the village mosque, he felt here how totally were everyone and everything in the hands of Allah, and how everything he could see and hear and smell from the top of this tree had been here for longer than men's memories, and would be here long after he and his sons and his sons' sons had joined their ancestors. Trotting away from the bolong toward the sun for a little while, Kunta finally reached the head-high grass surrounding the grove where he was going to pick out and chop a section of tree trunk just the right size for the body of his drum. If the green wood started drying and curing today, he figured it would be ready to hollow out and work on in a moon and a half, about the time he and Lamin would be returning from their trip to Mali. As he stepped into the grove, Kunta saw a sudden movement out of the corner of his eye. It was a hare, and the wolo dog was after it in a flash as it raced for cover in the tall grass. He was obviously chasing it for sport rather than food, since he was barking furiously. Kunta knew that a hunting wolo never made noise if he was really hungry. The two of them were soon out of earshot but Kunta knew that his dog would come back when he lost interest in the chase. Kunta headed forward to the center of the grove, where he would find more trees from which to choose a trunk of the size, smoothness, and roundness that he wanted. The soft, mossy earth felt good under his feet as he walked deeper into the dark grove, but the air here was damp and cold, he noticed, the sun not being high enough or hot enough, yet to penetrate the thick foliage overhead. Leaning his weapons and axe against a warped tree, he wandered here and there, occasionally stooping, his eyes and fingers examining for just the right trunk, one just a little bit larger, to allow for drying shrinkage than he wanted his drum to be. He was bending over a likely prospect when he heard the sharp crack of a twig, followed quickly by the squawk of a parrot overhead. It was probably the dog returning, he thought, in the back of his mind. But no grown dog ever cracked a twig. He flashed, whirling in the same instant. In a blur, rushing at him, he saw a white face, a club upraised. 
heard heavy footfalls behind him. Two Bob! His foot lashed up and caught the man in the belly. It was soft and he heard a grunt, just as something hard and heavy grazed the back of Quinta's head and landed like a tree trunk on his shoulder. Sagging under the pain, Quinta spun, turning his back on the man who lay doubled over on the ground at his feet and pounded with his fists on the faces of two black men who were lunging at him with a big sack and at another two bob swinging a short, thick club, which missed him this time as he sprang aside. His brain screaming for any weapon, Quintel leaped into them, clawing, butting, kneeing, gouging, hardly feeling the club that was pounding against his back, as three of them went down with him, sinking to the ground under their combined weight, a knee smashed into Quinta's lower back, rocking him with such pain that he gasped. His open mouth meeting flesh, his teeth clamped, cut, tore, his numb fingers finding a face, he clawed deeply into an eye, hearing its owner howl as again the heavy club met Quinta's head. Dazed, he heard a dog snarling, a two-bob screaming, then a sudden, piteous yelp. Scrambling to his feet, wildly twisting, dodging, ducking to escape more clubbing, with blood streaming from his split head, he saw one black cupping his eye, one of the two-bob holding a bloody arm, standing over the body of the dog, and the remaining pair circling him with raised clubs. Screaming his rage, Quinta went for the second two-bob, his fists meeting and breaking the force of the descending club. Almost choking with the awful two-bob stink, he tried desperately to wrench away the club. Why had he not heard them, sensed them, smelled them? Just then the black's club smashed into Kunta once again, staggering him to his knees, and the two-bob sprang loose, his head ready to explode, his body reeling, raging at his own weakness, Quinta reared up and roared, flailing blindly at the air, everything blurred with tears and blood and sweat. He was fighting for more than his life now. Omoro, Binta, Lamin, Suwadu, Madi. The two Bob's heavy club crashed against his temple, and all went black. Chapter 34 Kunta wondered if he had gone mad. Naked, chained, shackled, he awoke on his back between two other men in a pitch darkness full of steamy heat and sickening stink and a nightmarish bedlam of shrieking, weeping, praying, and vomiting. He could feel and smell his own vomit on his chest and belly. His whole body was one spasm of pain from the beatings he had received in the four days since his capture, but the place where the hot iron had been put between his shoulders hurt the most. A rat's thick, furry body brushed his cheek, its whiskered nose sniffing at his mouth. Quivering with revulsion, Kunta snapped his teeth together desperately, and the rat ran away. In rage, Quinta snatched and kicked against the shackles that bound his wrists and ankles. Instantly, angry exclamations and jerking came from whomever he was shackled to. The shock and pain adding to his fury, Quinta lunged upward, his head bumping hard against wood, right on the spot where he had been clubbed by the two bob back in the woods. Gasping and snarling, he and the unseen man next to him battered their iron cuffs at each other until both slumped back in exhaustion. Quinta felt himself starting to vomit again, and he tried to force it back, but couldn't. His already emptied belly squeezed up a thin, sour fluid that drained from the side of his mouth as he lay wishing that he might die. He told himself that he mustn't lose control again if he wanted to save his strength and his sanity. After a while, when he felt he could move again, he very slowly and carefully explored his shackled right wrist and ankle with his left hand. They were bleeding. 
He pulled lightly on the chain. It seemed to be connected to the left ankle and wrist of the man he had fought with. On Kunta's left, chained to him by the ankles, lay some other man, someone who kept up a steady moaning, and they were all so close that their shoulders, arms, and legs touched if any of them moved even a little. Remembering the wood he had bumped into with his head, Kunta drew himself upward again, just enough for it to bump gently. There wasn't enough space to even sit up. And behind his head was a wooden wall. I'm trapped like a leopard in a snare, he thought. Then he remembered sitting in the darkness of the manhood training hut after being taken blindfolded to the Jujuo so many rains before, and a sob welled up in his throat, but he fought it back. Quinta made himself think about the cries and groans he was hearing all around him. There must be many men here in the blackness, some close, some farther away, some beside him, others in front of him, but all in one room, if that's what this was. Straining his ears, he could hear still more cries, but they were muffled and came from below, beneath the splintery planking he lay on. Listening more intently, he began to recognize the different tongues of those around him. Over and over, in Arabic, a Fulani was shouting, Allah in heaven, help me and a man of the Sereri tribe was hoarsely wailing what must have been the names of his family. But mostly, Quinta heard Mandinkas, the loudest of them babbling wildly in the Sirakango secret talk of men, vowing terrible deaths to all Tubob. The cries of the others were so slurred with weeping that Quinta could identify neither their words nor their languages although he knew that some of the strange talk he heard must come from beyond the Gambia. As Quinta lay listening, he slowly began to realize that he was trying to push from his mind the impulse to relieve the demands of his bowels, which he had been forcing back for days. But he could hold it in no longer, and finally the feces curled out between his buttocks. Revolted at himself, Smelling his own addition to the stench, Quinta began sobbing, and again his belly spasmed, producing this time only a little spittle, but he kept gagging. What sins was he being punished for in such a manner as this? He pleaded to Allah for an answer. It was sin enough that he hadn't prayed once since the morning he went for the wood to make his drum, though he couldn't get onto his knees. And he knew not even which way was east, he closed his eyes where he lay and prayed, beseeching Allah's forgiveness. Afterward, Quinta lay for a long time bathing dully in his pains, and slowly became aware that one of them, in his knotted stomach, was nothing more than hunger. It occurred to him that he hadn't eaten anything since the night before his capture, he was trying to remember if he had slept in all that time, when suddenly he saw himself walking along a trail in the forest. Behind him walked two blacks, ahead of him a pair of two bob with their strange clothes and their long hair and strange colors. Quint had jerked his eyes open and shook his head. He was soaked in sweat and his heart was pounding. He had been asleep without knowing. It had been a nightmare. Or was the nightmare the stinking blackness? No, it was as real as the scene in the forest in his dream had been. Against his will, it all came back to him. After fighting the black slaties and the two bob so desperately in the grove of trees, he remembered awakening into a wave of blinding pain and finding himself gagged, blindfolded, and bound with his wrists behind him and his ankles hobbled with knotted rope. Thrashing to break free, he was jabbed savagely with sharp sticks until blood ran down his legs. Yanked onto his feet and prodded with the sticks to begin moving, he stumbled ahead of them as fast as his hobbles would permit. Somewhere along the banks of the Bolong, Quinta could tell by the sounds and the feel of the soft ground beneath his feet, he was shoved down into a canoe. Still blindfolded, he heard the slaties grunting, rowing swiftly with the two bob hitting him whenever he struggled. Landing, Again they walked, 
until finally that night, they reached a place where they threw Kunta on the ground, tied him with his back to a bamboo fence, and, without warning, pulled off his blindfold. It was dark, but he could see the pale face of the two bobs standing over him, and the silhouettes of others like him on the ground nearby. The two bob held out some meat for him to bite off a piece. He turned his head aside and clamped his jaws. Hissing with rage, the two bob grabbed him by the throat and tried to force his mouth open. When Quinta kept it shut tight, the two bob drew back his fist and punched him hard in the face. Quinta was left alone the rest of the night. At dawn, he began to make out, tied to other bamboo trunks, the figures of the other captured people, eleven of them, six men, three girls, and two children all guarded closely by armed slaties and two bob. The girls were naked. Kunta could only avert his eyes. He never had seen a woman naked before. The men, also naked, sat with murderous hatred etched in their faces, grimly silent and crusted with blood from whip cuts. But the girls were crying out, one about dead loved ones in a burned village, another bitterly weeping, rocked back and forth cooing endearments to an imaginary infant in her cradled arms, and the third shrieked at intervals that she was going to Allah. In wild fury, Kunta lunged back and forth, trying to break his bonds. A heavy blow with a club again knocked him senseless. When he came to, he found that he too was naked, that all of their heads had been shaved, and their bodies smeared with red palm oil. At around noonday, two new Tubab entered the grove. The Slaties, now all grins, quickly untied the captives from the bamboo trunks, shouting to them to stand in a line. Kunta's muscles were knotted with rage and fear. One of the new Tubab was short and stout, and his hair was white. The other towered over him, tall and huge and scowling, with deep knife scars across his face but it was the white-haired one before whom the Slaties and the other two bob grinned and all but bowed. Looking at them all, the white-haired one gestured for Kunta to step forward, and lurching backward in terror, Kunta screamed as a whip seared across his back. A Slatee from behind grappled him downward to his knees, jerking his head backward. The white-haired Tubab calmly spread Kunta's trembling lips and studied his teeth. Kunta attempting to spring up, but after another blow of the whip, he stood as ordered, his body quivering as the Tubab's fingers explored his eyes, his chest, his belly. When the fingers grasped his photo, he lunged aside with a choked cry. Two slaties and more lashings were needed to force Kunta to bend over almost double, and in horror he felt his buttocks being spread wide apart. Then the white-haired Tubab roughly shoved Kunta aside and, one by one, he similarly inspected the others, even the private parts of the wailing girls. Then whips and shouted commands sent the captives all dashing, around within the enclosure, and next springing up and down on their haunches. After observing them, the white-haired Tubob and the huge one with the knife-scarred face stepped a little distance away and spoke briefly in low tones. Stepping back, the white-haired one, beckoning another Tubob, jabbed his finger at four men, one of them Kunta, and two of the girls. The Tubob looked. The Tubob looked shocked, pointing at the others in a beseeching manner, but the white-haired one shook his head firmly. Quinta sat straining against his bonds, his head threatening to burst with rage as the two bub argued heatedly. After a while, the white-haired one disgustedly wrote something on a piece of paper that the other two bub angrily accepted. Quinta struggled and howled with fury as the slaties grabbed him again wrestling him to a seated position with his back arched. Eyes wide with terror, he watched as a two-bob withdrew from the fire a long, thin iron that the white-haired one had brought with him. 
Quinta was already thrashing and screaming as the iron exploded pain between his shoulders. The bamboo grove echoed with the screams of the others, one by one. Then red palm oil was rubbed over the peculiar LL shape Quinta saw on their backs. Within the hour, they were hobbling in a line of clanking chains, with the Slaty's ready whips flailing down on anyone who balked or stumbled. Quinta's back and shoulders were ribboned with bleeding cuts when late that night they reached two canoes hidden under thick, overhanging mangroves at the river's banks. Split into two groups, they were rowed through darkness by the Slaties, with the two bob lashing out at any sign of struggle. When Quinta saw a vast dark shape looming up ahead in the night, he sensed that this was his last chance. Springing and lunging amid shouts and screams around him, he almost upset the canoe in his struggle to leap overboard, but he was bound to the others and couldn't make it over the side. He almost didn't feel the blows of the whips and clubs against his ribs, his back, his face, his belly, his head, as the canoe bumped against the side of the great dark thing. Through the pain, he could feel the warm blood pouring down his face, and he heard above him the exclamations of many too, Bob. Then ropes were being looped around him, and he was helpless to resist. After being half pushed and half pulled up some strange rope ladder, he had enough strength left to twist his body wildly in another break for freedom. Again he was lashed with whips, and hands were grabbing him amid an overwhelming two-bob smell, and the sound of women shrieking and loud two-bob cursing. Through swollen lids, Quinta saw a thicket of legs and feet all around him, and managing an upward glance while trying to shield his bleeding face with his forearm, he saw the short two-bob with the white hair standing calmly making marks in a small book with a stubby pencil. Then he felt himself being snatched upright and shoved roughly across a flat space. He caught a glimpse of tall poles with thick wrappings of coarse white cloth. Then he was being guided, stumbling weakly down some kind of narrow steps into a place of pitch blackness. At the same instant, his nose was assaulted by an unbelievable stink and his ears by cries of anguish. Quinta began vomiting as the two bob, holding dim yellowish flames that burned within metal frames carried by a ring, shackled his wrists and ankles, then shoved him backward, close between two other moaning men. Even in his terror, he sensed that lights bobbing in other directions meant that the two bob were taking those who had come with him to be shackled elsewhere. Then he felt his thoughts slipping. He thought he must be dreaming, and then, mercifully, he was. Chapter 35 Only the rasping sound of the deck hatch being opened told Quinta if it was day or night. Hearing the latch click, he would jerk his head up, the only free movement that his chains and shackles would allow, and four shadowy two-bob figures would descend, two of them with bobbing lights and whips guarding the other pair as they all moved along the narrow aisleways pushing a tub of food. They would thrust tin pans of the stuff up onto the filth between each two shackle mates. So far, each time the food had come, Quinta had clamped his jaws shut, preferring to starve to death, until the aching of his empty stomach had begun to make his hunger almost as terrible as the pains from his beatings. When those on Quinta's level had been fed, the lights showed the two bob descending farther below with the rest of the food. Less often than the feeding times, and usually when it was night outside, the two bob would bring down into the hold some new captives, screaming and whimpering in terror as they were shoved and lashed along to wherever they were to be chained into empty spaces along the rows of hard plank shelves. One day, shortly after a feeding time, Quinta's ears picked up a strange muted sound that seemed to vibrate through the ceiling over his head. 
Some of the other men heard it too, and their moaning ended abruptly. Quinta lay listening intently. It sounded as if many feet were dashing about overhead. Then, much nearer to them in the darkness, came a new sound, as if some very heavy object being creaked very slowly upward. Quinta's naked back felt an odd vibration from the hard, rough planking he lay on. He felt a tightening, a swelling within his chest, and he lay frozenly. About him, he heard thudding sounds that he knew were men lunging upward, straining against their chains. It felt as if all of his blood had rushed into his pounding head, and then terror went clawing into his vitals as he sensed in some way that this place was moving, taking them away. Men started shouting all around him, screaming to Allah and his spirits, banging their heads against the planking, thrashing wildly against their rattling shackles. Allah, I will never pray to you less than five times daily, Quinta shrieked into the bedlam. Hear me, help me. The anguished cries, weeping, and prayers continued, subsiding only as one after another exhausted man went limp and lay gasping for breath in the stinking blackness. Quinta knew that he would never see Africa again. He could feel clearly now, through his body against the planks, a slow rocking motion, sometimes enough that his shoulders or arms or hips would press against the brief warmth of one of the men he was chained between. He had shouted so hard that he had no voice left, so his mind screamed it instead kill two bob and their traitor black helpers he was sobbing quietly when the hatch opened and the four two bob came bumping down with their tub of food again he clamped his jaws against his spasms of hunger but then he thought of something the contango had once said that warriors and hunters must eat well to have greater strength than other men Starving himself meant that weakness would prevent him from killing two Bob, so this time, when the pan was thrust onto the boards between him and the man next to him, Quinta's fingers also clawed into the thick mush. It tasted like ground maize boiled with palm oil. Each gulping swallow pained his throat in the spot where he had been choked for not eating before, but he swallowed until the pan was empty. He could feel the food like a lump in his belly, and soon it was rising up his throat. He couldn't stop it, and a moment later the gruel was back on the planking. He could hear, over the sound of his own retching, that of others doing the same thing. As the lights approached the end of the long shelf of planks on which Kunta lay, suddenly he heard chains rattling, a head bumping and then a man screaming hysterically in a curious mixture of mandinka and what sounded like some two-bob words. An uproarious burst of laughter came from the two-bob with the feeding tub, then their whips lashing down until the man's cries lapsed into babbling and whimpering. Could it be? Had he heard an African-speaking two-bob? Was there a slatey down there among them? Quinta had heard that Tubob would often betray their black trader helpers and throw them into chains. After the Tubob had gone down to the level below, scarcely a sound was heard on Quinta's level until they reappeared with their emptied tub and climbed back up outside, closing the hatch behind them. At that instant, an angry buzzing began in different tongues, like bees swarming. Then, down the shelf from where Kunta lay, there was a heavy chain-rattling blow, a howl of pain and bitter cursing in the same hysterical mandinka. Kunta heard the man shriek, You think I am too, Bob? There were more violent, rapid blows and desperate screams. Then the blows stopped, and in the blackness of the hold came a high squealing, and then an awful gurgling sound as if a man whose breath was being choked off. Another rattling of chains, a tattoo of bare heels kicking at the planks, then quiet. 
Quinta's head was throbbing and his heart was pounding as voices around him began screaming, Slaty! Slaties die! Then Quinta was screaming along with them and joining in a wild rattling of chains, when suddenly with a rasping sound the hatch was opened. Admitting its shaft of daylight and a group of two bob with lights and whips, they had obviously heard the commotion below them, and though now almost total silence had fallen in the hold, the two bob rushed among the aisles, shouting and lashing, left and right with their whips. When they left without finding the dead man, the hold remained silent for a long moment. Then, very quietly, Kunta heard a mirthless laugh from the end of the shelf next to where the traitor lay dead. The next feeding was a tense one. As if the two bob sensed something amiss, their whips fell even more often than usual. Kunta jerked and cried out as a bolt of pain cut across his legs. He had learned that when anyone didn't cry out from a blow, he would get a severe beating until he did. Then he clawed and gulped down the tasteless mush as his eyes followed the lights moving on down along the shelf. Every man in the hold was listening when one of the two bob exclaimed something to the others. A jostling of lights could be seen, then more exclamations and cursings, and then one of the two bob rushed down the aisle and up through the hatch, and he soon returned with two more. Kunta could hear the iron cuffs and chains being unlocked. Two of the two bob then half carried, half dragged the body of the man along the aisle and up the hatch while the others continued bumping their food tub along the aisles. The food team was on the level below when four more two bob climbed down through the hatch and went directly to where the slaty had been chained. By twisting his head, Kunta could see the lights raised high. With violent cursing, two of the two bob sent their whips whistling down against flesh. Whoever was being beaten refused at first to scream, though just listening to the force of the blows was almost paralyzing to Kunta. He could hear the beaten man flailing against his chains in the agony of his torture, and of his grim determination not to cry out. When the two bob were almost shrieking their curses, and the lights could be seen changing hands as one man spelled the other with the lash. Finally, the beaten man began screaming, first a fula curse, then things that could not be understood, though they too were in the Fula tongue. Kunta's mind flashed a thought of quiet, gentle Fula tribe who tended Mandinka cattle, as the lashing sounds continued until the beaten man barely whimpered. Then the four Tubab left, cursing, gasping, and gagging in the stink. The moans of the Fula shivered through the black hold. Then, after a while, a clear voice called out in Mandinka, Share his pain. We must be in this place as one village. The voice belonged to an elder. He was right. The Fula's pains had been as Quinta's own. He felt himself about to burst with rage. He also felt, in some nameless way, a terror greater than he had ever known before and it seemed to spread from the marrow of his bones. Part of him wanted to die, to escape all of this, but no, he must live to avenge it. He forced himself to lie absolutely still. It took a long while, but finally he felt his strain and confusion, even his body's pains, begin to ebb except for the place between his shoulders where he had been burned with the hot iron. He found that his mind could focus better now on the only choice that seemed to lie before him and the others. Either they would all die in this nightmare place, or somehow the Tubab would have to be overcome and killed. <laughs>